I was willing to turn down essentially what could have been the very budget of the film that I made just for the script itself. It was personal enough to me that I thought I'll be fine scraping by as long as I can find somebody who will let me make this. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Keith Thomas is on the show. Keith is a screenwriter and director whose first feature, The Vigil, was released today on Video On Demand. If you're looking for a highly original, disturbing, and freaky horror film, check it out this weekend. The Vigil is about a man providing overnight watch to a deceased member of his former Orthodox Jewish community who encounters a malevolence entity. To be more specific, the man watching the body is a shomer. Under Jewish religious law, a shomer is a legal guardian entrusted with the custody and care of another's object. In this case, a recently deceased body waiting to be taken to the morgue the next morning. We talk about this in the interview, but one of the many impressive things about the vigil is how much edge-of-your-seat tension and suspense Keith created with just a few characters and locations. I call this minimalist filmmaking, but the result, when done well, is anything but minimalist, and is actually a full, robust, and terrifying narrative. I don't know about you, but over the last year, one of the things my kids and I have found solace in while quarantined during the pandemic is horror movies. And after seeing quite a few of them recently, I feel qualified to tell you that The Vigil is well worth the price of admission. But don't take my word for it. Take Stephen King's word. Stephen saw The Vigil before it was released, and he liked it so much, he approved Keith to direct a remake of Stephen's 1984 film Firestarter, starring a young Drew Barrymore, which of course was based on Stephen King's novel of the same name. In this interview, Keith talks about what inspired him to write the screenplay for The Vigil, how his career as a medical researcher in nursing homes informed his narratives in both his short film Arcane and The Vigil, how a very specific world or community with a defined set of rules, like the Hasidic Jewish community in Brooklyn where this movie is set, can make for a compelling setting in a horror movie, why he rejected an offer to buy this screenplay and instead chose to direct it on his own, why he cast Dave Davis as the lead, how making his short film Arcane which is still available on YouTube, by the way, open the door to making the vigil and how aspiring filmmakers can make short films to open similar opportunities. So without further ado, let's jump into my chat with Keith Thomas. Keith Thomas, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I have been really looking forward to this because I I watched the film, The Vigil, and thank you for the screener, by the way, or your people anyway sent me the screener. (laughs) And um, I really appreciated the minimalism of the movie. Mm. I think that really added to how freaky it got uh, as things progressed. And ironically for me, um, the the fewer uh, locations and the fewer uh, actual plot points that are happening, you know, actions, the more you're focused on the internal part of what's happening and the more you get to see, um, you know, the, the protagonist's face and the close-ups, and really focus in on just the freakiness of what is going down in this movie. So mm. I, I wanted to um, just comment and right out of the gate about the minimalism of the movie and ask you if that was intentional on your part due to budget intentional due to just wanting to create a film that has those elements those psychological elements without the focus the extraneous focus of um extra characters and sets and that type of thing you know it's kind of a combination of all of the above in that for budgetary reasons um, I knew, so I, I, I guess to back it up, I would say it was going to be my first feature and that was kind of what I always intended. And so I knew I was not going to get that much money in terms of budget. So mm-hmm. I knew I had to, uh, make it very contained and kind of, you know, bring it down at the same time, you know, when I had written the script, 
uh, it hit, my manager kind of sent it out. And there were a few people interested in buying it, but, but not letting me direct and actually upping the budget. Hmm. And I thought that was silly. It didn't make any sense. Why would you throw a bunch of money at this thing? And why would you expand it? I, I, I thought streamlining it made a lot of sense. A, for me as a f- first time filmmaker in terms of the, this being the first feature. And B, the story didn't need it. I, I liked it being very minimalist. It literally is, you know, a dark night of the soul for one person. Um, And there are some characters that move in and out of that orbit, but we didn't need to be anywhere, but in front of that body for most of it. So there was, there was kind of a simplicity to that, Mm -hmm. you know, and as the script kind of morphed and did its thing, sure. There were other additional scenes that I cut uh, in the scripting phase uh, that I a for budget or just because it just didn't seem necessary for example, there was a scene that I had written. There, there's a, you know, a part of our main character's backstory is a traumatic event, and associated with that traumatic event was a scene that I had written that involved an ambulance that involved a, a tra- you know, ambulance traveling to a hospital, and a scene in the back of that ambulance. And that was one of those things where, it's like, you know, yeah, it could have added a little, but we just did, it didn't need it. The, a, the film didn't need it, and we didn't need it for the budget. So it was. All of those things kind of combined. Uh, it just made sense for it to be streamlined and minimalistic in terms of the story we were telling. So let's go back to the moment where you you have an offer to buy your screenplay. As mm. someone who is just coming up in the film world and you have a short under your belt, uh, which was fantastic, by the way, I saw it on oh, YouTube. <laughs> uh, it, but the, and what's the short's name? It's called Arcane. Arcane. Yeah. Sorry. I I lost the name, even though I just watched it like an hour (laughs) ago. But um, so you have this short under your belt, but you are pretty much brand new to the feature Mm -hmm. film world and and Mm -hmm. you're offered money on this screenplay. Mm -hmm. Was that a crossroads for you or was it an easy decision to just say, nope, we're going to make this the way I envisioned? (laughs) You know, for a hot second, it was, there was some thought, I, you know, there was, uh, I, I had a meeting, so there was some interest in it. And I, I actually had a meeting, um, with a production company about it. And it was pretty obvious that I wasn't going to be allowed to direct, which, you know, it, it depended on how much I was being offered. So, you know, it was definitely a moment where I thought, okay, huh, maybe I could sell this if the price is right and be okay with directing something else i had written a feature film version of arcane because arcane was essentially a uh, a promo of you know a, a way a showcase of a feature version of that that story and that was something else that i had been shopping at the time um but once i got in those conversations and we started talking about uh, what would the vigil become it was clear that a, it wouldn't be right for the vigil. And B, I didn't want to lose that opportunity. So, you know, I was willing to turn down essentially what could have been the very budget of the film that I made just for the just for the script itself. Uh, I turned that down to you know, make it be the first feature. It was personal enough to me that I thought, you know, I can I'll be fine you know, scraping by as long as I can find somebody who will let me make this. That's interesting because I I would imagine as a filmmaker making my way into that world that the money has to be so enticing because you're struggling. You're trying to Mm -hmm. figure out a way to fund your own projects. And here you are given uh, an offer of an amount that would allow you to pretty much fund a brand new project, <laughs> just walk away and, just, sure. and keep going. Sure, but, make something else. But I'm glad that you held on to it because I think this this felt like it was personal for you. And I don't know why that is because I don't know you, but it <laughs> felt like it really came from a place of understanding of this community, the Hasidic Jewish community. Mm. Uh, it came from a place of understanding of horror uh, history. Um, and I've I've heard you in other interviews talk about your influences and The Exorcist being one of your influences, which 
still to this day, I think I have psychic scars from because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, I am a child of the seventies and I, I don't know why my parents let me watch that movie, but they did. And I'm still paying for it to this day, <laughs> but you, um, you can really tell that this is a, a labor of love when you're watching mm. this film and beautifully executed in terms of, I mean, the, the casting fantastic. Mm. Um, let's talk about the lead character. Yeah. Um, Dave Davis, who is this chameleon like actor that I did not know before I watched this film, but I looked at his IMDb and he kind of reminds me and how many films he's been in and the different mm -hmm. roles he's played. Uh, have you ever heard of Cliff Curtis? Yeah, sure. <laughs> from, <laughs> from Whale Rider. He kind of reminds me of Cliff Curtis in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. He has this, um, like handsome lead role, uh, vibe to him but he can mm -hmm. do anything and i think his comfort zone is in support roles and character acting so how did you find him and what made him right for this role you know this uh, the whole story of kind of how the vigil got made is very much a story of kind of serendipity and uh just things coming together kind of out of the blue you know, it began, like I said, I had gotten the offer for the script without my services as a director. Um, and I turned that down. And then my manager just happened to suggest to me, you know, I got these other producers. They make horror films. Uh, that's all they make. Um, but I think you're going to find them fascinating. They read the script. They're interested in meeting you. I went to meet with them in L.A. And uh, I walk in and there are two young guys in their 20s. Uh, Orthodox Jews with yarmulkes who are in a room with just tons of horror memorabilia. And just from that moment, it was like, wow, like who else can make this movie? Like Orthodox Jews who love horror. <laughs> so from that moment, there were just many more instances of the same sort of thing. So with casting, I had written the script with a face in my head. It's, it's impossible when you're writing not to put yourself in these characters. So it wasn't that I saw myself as Yaakov. It was more that I just, I had an idea of who he needed to be, like what he needed to look like and feel like. And we were casting and I was talking to a lot of really good actors, actors who were either from the community or spoke Yiddish or knew the world. And as amazing as they were, they, I just wasn't finding my Yaakov, the, the, the kind of gut thing. And so I took a break from casting for a little bit uh, for like a few days. I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I need to take a break. And I happened to be flicking through Netflix or one of the streamers and came across this movie, Bomb City, in which Dave Davis plays a punk in 1980s Texas. He's got a giant green mohawk. But I knew two things looking at him in that. Number one, he just had this, he was able to wear his emotions and his expressiveness in a way that I thought, yes, that is Yaakov, that that's the character, that's the face. And the second thing that I knew is just, we Jews know each other. And I could tell, I was like, this guy's Jewish. I can, I, even with that <laughs> green mohawk, I know. Um, and I was right. And I told my producers about him. I said, hey, this is the kind of guy I need, like someone who could do this. And they're like, well, contact him. So I did, and he read the script, and he has his own stories about what happened when he read the script. But he was like, yeah, I want to do this. Now, Dave's like me. Neither of us have Jewish names or, you know, don't. But we both come from Jewish backgrounds. And, you know, Dave really threw himself into this project uh, far beyond what I even envisioned. He didn't know any Yiddish when he showed up. Uh, but he just threw himself into the community. He studied. Um, he learned all that dialect and it is a very particular, it's not just Yiddish, it's a particular pronunciation of the Yiddish that even our advisors, people who were Hasidic, who grew up in the neighborhood, they were like blown away by what he was doing. So that's just on the technical level in terms of his pronunciation. And, but he also just embodied this thing. You know, he talks about how exhausting the shoot was in a lot of ways. It was, it was very, uh, productive he very enjoyed it but it was still exhausting because he was scared for those four weeks that we were shooting he had to be he had to put himself in this place where without much dialogue he had to show just on his face this sort of 
this terror and this struggle. Um, and, you know, like I said, it just, I just happened to see bomb city and notice him like that. And my gut said, yeah, this is the guy, this is Yaakov. And, and he, he truly became him. Couldn't have been anyone else. So you, you literally just saw him and then saw this possibility, saw the potential yeah. from his role in bomb city. Yeah. And it was funny because I had heard that about casting before in terms of like this gut thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were definitely, you know, you kind of struggle. You're like, well, he's going to have to learn the Yiddish. I've got another actor here who knows the Yiddish already, who knows this neighborhood, who grew up like just blocks away from here. And yet I'm pushing for the guy who doesn't know the Yiddish. But my gut it just told me like, Dave can do this. Dave is going to throw himself into this and he can do it. And, and if he does, then we're going to get the performance that is beyond the kind of what we might expect. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what Dave did. Yeah, he did it with a uh, plum for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what I also noticed about the film is that there's this hyper specific setting and world that you created. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if the hyper specificity is helpful in the context of film. In other words, the, the more specific it is, the more rules there are. For instance, you have religious rules, and those sort of come, you know, baked into the movie. You you have this Shomer, you know, that uh, the Shomer rules about what you can and can't do <laughs> while you're watching the body. Um, does that make it easier to write a story when you start very specific in terms of the, the characters, their uh, worldviews, and their specifically their religion? I think so. I find that very liberating. Uh, weirdly enough, like when you kind of start at a very broad space and you say, I'm going to make a supernatural horror film and I'm going to have to invent some sort of entity or some sort of thing with it, the rules, it can be very unwieldy and you end up going down a lot of different paths to try to figure out, okay, well, here are these rules or the, you know, these are ones that work. These don't, if you begin in a very specific space of like, so for me, it was not just the world in terms of the Hasidic world that I wanted to be as authentic as possible. And it was just me kind of replacing or moving from the exterior into the interior things that already existed and all the baggage that came with it. Um, but then in terms of the, the, the sort of malevolent, you know, uh, thing at the center of this film, I w wanted to find something real that, that, that is a rabbinical uh, a demon and it, so for me, that's very helpful to A, it, the stuff comes with his, its own history um, and B, it kind of has its own rules that you are able to work with in rather than kind of making them up. Obviously, we had to make some stuff up. I had to kind of create the look of the, the mozic, the, the demon in the film. But it's also very helpful just in terms of production for actors. Uh, you know, we that house that we were in, a real house. Um, it was very important that everything in that house be as authentic as possible to that world down to stuff. You don't see there's stuff in drawers and you know, that that's important to me that, that Dave, if, if he was in a scene and opened a drawer, he wouldn't be taken out of the scene by looking in there and seeing like a dominoes flyer, you know, it's it, that it'd be very specific to the world that whatever's in there. Um, so th that sort of world building um, I think is crucial to getting the atmosphere, getting the performances, but also just kind of setting up the type of story you're telling. Um, and I prefer that sort of like taking from a real world place and bringing it into the supernatural, than kind of just whole cloth, making something up and attempting to pull it off. Cause that's, that's years and decades even of work go into trying to make something that's going to feel real. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place, our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks, and now back to the interview. So 
the the next question I have pertains to the the characters that you choose to be your protagonists and antagonists in, in a feature like this, and also in a short like Arcane, where um, I find, and this is my observation, and maybe it's just me and I'm projecting, or maybe it's a universal truth, but I find that when you have really old people or really mm -hmm. young people, <laughs> that it adds a layer of uh, terror to a narrative potentially, because I think the older you get, the less predictable someone is. Mm -hmm. And same thing with kids, like in The Exorcist, uh, you have this, I think she was 12 years old at the time, uh, where um, she's, you know, she, she's the, um, but she's possessed, but she's she's very unpredictable, even when she's not possessed, because she's a child and she doesn't mm -hmm. know all the rules yet. And and then you have this elderly person who's um, kind of on the in the sunset of their life, and maybe they're going through dementia or whatever, but they're unpredictable too. Did you think about that as you you were writing this feature? Is that something that was conscious or not in your mind at all? No, it was definitely conscious, and I, I agree with you. I I am attracted to that kind of uh, you know the, the the difference, the kind of counterbalance of youth and age, and the, the psychology of it. Um, and at the same time, it came from a personal place. I, I think that's why it's, you see it in Arcane and in the Vigil, in that in my career as a clinical researcher before I you know, embarked on filmmaking. Um, I did for part of it, I did, uh, drug studies in nursing homes. And so I spent a lot of time with demented and, uh, Alzheimer's patients. Um, and so I witnessed firsthand kind of, if you're visiting somebody every month over the course of a year and they're in serious cognitive decline, you end up seeing, um, this kind of fascinating and tragic, um, sort of change in somebody. And, and for me, a lot of that, that work showed just how fragile an identity is and a personality, um, it, which is very scary because we tend to think of ourselves as who we are and that that's unshakable, that this is who I am because of my history. But if you take away your history, who are you? Mm -hmm. If you take away your memories, who are you? How do you know? Mm -hmm. And so that aspect you know, for me is just something that was always kind of a source of both fascination and fear. And I thought that, you know, I will loved exploring that. And so if you have a character like that, who is unreliable because they are, you know, they've got dementia or their mind is slipping and you team them up with somebody who is not the person who's the stable one to, to help them. You turn someone who's also at the kind of edge themselves in terms of figuring themselves out, like that's an interesting crisis mm -hmm. to be put in. Um, and so that's where I thought, you know, in terms of the vigil, A, we're in a house, there's this guy who has his own struggles, who's trying to figure himself out. And the only other person that could potentially help him is not all there, is, is, is kind of already left. Um, so I thought, yeah, that would be really tense and, and make for an interesting dichotomy. Yeah. And then the, um, prospective girlfriend too, that, that was sort of trying to court him or flirting with him <laughs> throughout the film. And then he can't even trust, is it her? <laughs> right. uh, so you're, it's really unsettling. And I, I'm trying not to give too much away because I want the listeners to go in like I did with zero expectations mm -hmm. or understanding of, of what's going to happen. Um, so I understand that this was uh, po in post-production during the pandemic, or at least was going to potentially be released during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now we are coming upon a, th a theatrical release, or I guess I'll put that in quotes, theatrical release, <laughs> right. uh, but streaming release. And when can we see the film streaming? Yeah, so it'll be released on February 26th. It'll be both VOD kind of on demand through cable suppliers and, you know, wh whatever place you rent movies online. Uh, and also some theaters that'll have a theatrical arm to it. Um, you know, right. The world's been turned upside down and it's interesting with the film coming out now, it's just a very different place than it was. Originally it was going to be released early in 2020. 
um, shortly after South by Southwest, where it was going to premiere, which of course canceled. Um, so yeah, we're finding it in a very different world. And in a world, interestingly enough, you know, when we shot the film, I think you know, contained horror has always kind of been a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it feels like today people understand being trapped in a house better than they certainly did before. <laughs> yeah, we're living in a contained horror. I mean, all of <laughs> right. us at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you think it's a renaissance happening right now, though, with horror films in general? We've definitely seen a lot of really fascinating stuff coming up in the last 10 years or so. Uh, it's kind of one of the reasons I've been attracted to horror for a long time was horror was a genre in which you could do a lot of different things. You know, it's it's similar to comedy in the sense that, uh, you know, as long as it's funny, kind of no matter, you know, you could do whatever you want in a comedy uh, as long as the jokes are landing, you could explore all sorts of things. And in horror, it's similar. Um, and I feel like today's audiences are really hungrier than ever before for kind of uh, glimpses into worlds they may not be familiar with. And not in terms of, you know, outer space, but, you know, worlds here on Earth and communities here on Earth and stories from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, Midsummer, and, and, maybe. Yeah, a exactly. Good example of that. You know, and, and get out and, uh, you know, these stories, you know, the witch, for example, as well, but mm-hmm. stories where the engine of scaring an audience of the thrill ride is the same, but you are, you, they're more open as long as it's scary, they're more open to getting into, okay, yeah, I didn't know that, or that looks interesting. This feels different and new, even if some of the tropes of the horror film are the same, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of, you know, what's happening. There's some familiar framework, but you can really explore other, you know, other perspectives in a way that I think a lot of genres you can't. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's more difficult. Yeah. Um, so horror is very open to that and very flexible. Yeah, I love that about horror films and and also, I don't know, psychological thrillers too, but Midsommar, I wouldn't call that a horror movie necessarily, right. but it does drop you into a world you know nothing about, you've never heard about before. And uh, similarly with The Vigil, I think probably 95% of the audience <laughs> is probably going to be like, wow, this is just as foreign to them as mm. Midsommar's world would be because that community is pretty insulated and you yeah. really don't know a lot about that community. Yeah. Yeah. They're very, what's what I find fascinating about the community is that they are this right, very insular community that they speak their own, you know, their language, they're not interacting so much with the secular world. And yet they're living in the largest city in the United States. You mm-hmm. know, this is a community that is right there in Brooklyn, um, which is fascinating because you can, you know, be in the community and walk a few blocks and you're out completely. You know, it's, it's, it's this, 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 this thing that's very tight knit. Um, and yet, and, and yet very of its own time and, and place. And, uh, so it's interesting seeing the, uh, how much interest there has been in the Hasidic community with shows like unorthodox and, things kind of appearing where there's, I don't know, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know why suddenly there is this huge interest in it. Um, but, but it seemed to me, we'd never seen a horror film set there. We'd never seen a horror film kind of deal with these sorts of things. So it feel, felt like a unique opportunity to kind of dive in uh, to something that I was somewhat familiar with or familiar enough that I could write about it. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you one more question before we move on to other projects uh, about mm-hmm. the vigil. Now, um, there's a, a hate crime element to the film that mm-hmm. is pretty compelling involving a, a small boy. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you felt like you needed that plot point to add an emotional element or at least get to know this protagonist a, a little better and understand his perspective of why he may be, uh, you know, I guess the trauma that he's coming into mm-hmm. the scenes with. Yeah. F- you know, that sort of developed out of this idea of why would somebody leave? Like why leave the community? What's a, what's a cinematic interesting angle on that. Um, and there are of course many, uh, you know, many different stories. I, I spoke with lots of different ex Hasidic people about why they left and 
what those stories were. And you see some of those people in the movie, certainly in the beginning when they're all sitting around a table, all of those folks, uh, uh, you know, with a couple exceptions are ex Hasidic and left for various reasons. So I had to come up with something that was cinematic in terms of visceral and that was powerful enough that it would make somebody leave that they didn't feel like they were getting what they needed and they had to look somewhere else. At the same time, it was something that I witnessed myself. So it came from a, a real space. Um, when I lived in New York City, I saw an incident similar to this. It was not as extreme. It did not end the same way, but it was shocking. And you know, in some ways, it's ex- me exercising my own personal demons because when I witnessed this, I was frozen. I didn't do anything about it. It was on a busy street. No one did anything about it. Um, it happened, and then everyone just kind of moved on. Um, and I felt really guilty about it. Uh, that I didn't stand up for this child in in this sort of incident. Um, And so part of this is me sort of exercising my own demons in terms of uh, carrying around the guilt over seeing that, even though it was many, many years ago. Um, So, so yeah, so it kind of has multiple, multiple angles Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how it got there. Now I understand that Stephen King watched the vigil and has, um, anointed you or or (laughs) at least uh, approved of you being attached to a remake of Firestarter. Mm, Yes. Uh, So how does that feel to have that type of validation from a giant in the horror world like Stephen King? Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. I, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, one of those stories. I mean, we hear this a lot from, from filmmakers, but when I made the vigil, I was just trying to make the best movie that I could given what I had. Um, and I had a vision for the film in my head and I tried to come as close to realizing that vision as, as possible, but I had no expectations beyond that. It wasn't like, okay, this is, I'm going to make this movie and then I'm going to move on to this thing and then this thing. And I just get, you know, whatever. Um, so everything that happened afterwards in terms of getting into Toronto international film festival and, you know, getting the attention of folks, uh, like, uh, Jason Blum and Blumhouse, um, and then being, you know, you know, uh, uh, first discussing Firestarter, um, and then, you know, being attached to Firestarter and we're hoping to film it this year. Um, that's all been, been incredible. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, I've been offered a lot of different projects after the vigil had its premiere, but Firestarter was one that again, spoke personally to me. It was a book that I read as a kid. It was one of the first Stephen King books I read. And Again, it has a lot of these personal connections. Like I said, I was in clinical research and did drug studies. The core of Firestarter is a drug study, the LOT6 study that goes all sorts of awry and essentially gives birth to Charlie, the pyrokinetic kid. So, you know, I knew that world and there were just so many different ends. So, yeah, it was, I never expected it, but it's been really exciting and even more um what's been great about it is the you know Blumhouse and Universal trusting my vision for what Firestarter my kind of version of Firestarter could be that I think is both very very true to the book um but different that that's going to feel fresh uh and new uh in terms of you know what you'd expect in uh, in a Firestarter adaptation are you going to bring back uh, Drew in some capacity? <laughs> you know, I can't say, um, <laughs> but, but but I think uh, you know we we've got a, a really amazing cast, um, and you know it's it's one of those things where the sort of the thing that I liked most about making the vigil is the the tension and kind of this visceral sort of emotional thing, and that's very much true in Firestarter. I think you could. You could easily look at kind of on the surface of Firestarter of a, a little girl being chased by the shop um, and on the run with her dad for a large portion of it. But there's a lot of meat there, too. There's a, there's a very sort of fascinating emotional core of the movie, which is about parenthood, about how do you raise a child so they don't become a monster? And, and in reverse, how do you, as a child, navigate parenthood when when your parents are on the run and you're mm-hmm. kind of living in this underground life. So tons of, tons of great stuff in it. So um, this is a studio film then, 
the universe is involved. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you went straight from indie horror filmmaker <laughs> to big budget um, studio <laughs> filmmaker. How does that feel? You know, it, it's well. Here's so here's the nice thing about it is it's not. It doesn't feel at least so far as that much of a leap because you know the way Blumhouse operates is they really let the filmmakers um, kind of vision guide them in terms of it. So it feels more indie in the sense of kind of how it comes together, mm-hmm. even though it has a studio distribution and studio backing and, you know, the studio uh, very involved in the the property and kind of what this film looks like. It still is small in the yeah. sense that, uh, you know, there's a lot of filmmaker control in terms of, the look and the feel and what we're yeah. going for and uh you know maybe taking some risks which which i love is that what blumhouse offers to the equation is that that sort of small house um indie feel because that's my impression in looking at i don't know much about blumhouse but i they just have this vibe of being an indie film like love of horror movie operation yeah an indie film operation that is just, you know, uh, really excited by interesting stories and has found a lot of success in horror uh, and kind of pushing horror in new directions. Uh, so, yeah, no, you definitely get that feel in terms of it's very much kind of one on one. It's not so much a, a machine as it is just very committed people who want to make the most interesting kind of best stories that they can. and work with people who share that sort of enthusiasm. So, you know, a a good, a good partnership for sure. So for folks who are trying to break into the film world, Mm. um, I understand that you did not go to film school, correct? Right. Right. And you just started writing screenplays. Mm. Uh, At least that's what I gathered from prior interviews. Uh, So tell, tell my listeners if you could, and we're running out of time, but what advice would you give them if they want to make films and write screenplays and get their foot in the door in this world? Yeah. My advice I is probably don't follow my path because <laughs> I took a super circuitous, very weird path to get here. Um, but for me, so I wrote scripts for almost a decade. Um, most of which, you know, and you were never made into anything, certainly that you'd know or recognize. Um, and while I got paid for that work, it still, I wasn't, you know, getting to the state that I wanted to be at in terms of actually becoming a filmmaker. So for me, it was making something. The key was making Arcane. The key was kind of putting my money where my mouth was. And, you know, making a short film doesn't actually cost that much. You, you can do it, especially with today's technology, for very little. It's the idea, it's the execution that that takes, you know, a lot. But, you know, if you make something that is true to what you, your vision, that that isn't you just mimicking things you've seen, your favorite films or your scenes that you're stitching together as a fan of other work, but it's something that, you have to make something that you are driven to make that it's, you know, you kind of, it's possessed you and you have to create this thing. Uh, if you take the time and look, your first script, you have all the time in the world. There's nobody's waiting for you to deliver your first script. Rewrite it to death, get it perfect before you show it to anybody. Uh, and the same goes for, you know, making your first short. You have all the time in the world to get it ready. Don't don't bother shopping things around or sending things until it's ready. Um, and then just go there and make it. Um, actions speak louder than words uh, in this industry more than any. Now, for listeners who are interested in seeing um, your first, well, your first film project, Arcane, go to YouTube. It's A-R-K-A-N-E. Very mm-hmm. easy to find on YouTube. It's like seven or eight minutes long. Yeah. Um, and, and it was gripping. I mean, what, I have to be honest <laughs> with you. I, I'll be very honest with you, Keith. When people send me links to their shorts, I have this sense of dread because there's <laughs> so many really bad shorts out there. And that's not because they're bad filmmakers. I think it's just mm-hmm. really hard to pull off mm-hmm. something that is a compelling narrative in that short period of time mm-hmm. on the budget that they have. So what was your budget on Arcane? So Arcane, all told, was, I think, 15000 which, okay. 
you know, it was sizable. We had a crew and we had lots of, we had dolly tracks and a pretty good camera and, you know, a lot of stuff, but, you know, and, and, and the other thing I'd say is that's 15,000. I'm not getting back <laughs> right now. It's <laughs> buying a short film. Right. But it paid off in the vigil and it paid off in Firestarter. So it was worth it. You know, I had, you know, convinced my wife to let us, to let me use some of our savings mm-hmm. for that. And you know, her reaction was, yeah, that you, we can do it, but you better do it right. Like you better <laughs> get it right. And, you know, for, for what it is, it was effective and it did what it needed to do. And it kind of staked my claim in terms of like, okay, this is, this is me. This is my voice. Um, and luckily people responded to it. And that's what opened the door to the vigil then to be able to make yeah, the vigil. Yeah. Essentially that's what had happened. I had, you know, I had had representation as a screenwriter and I'm a novelist as well. And so I had kind of had these, you know, inroads, but they, I wasn't getting what I, what I wanted. And so I kind of stripped everything away and I made arcane here in, in Colorado where I live um, with an entirely Colorado crew. Um, and then when it was done and it was ready, I sent it back to the connect- connections I had in, in Hollywood. Uh, and I'm not, when I'm not talking like super famous people, I'm just talking, you know, people who worked as execs or whoever at various companies. Um, and through that, yeah, Arcane is how I met my manager. And then that is how I met the producers, the vigil. That's how I made the vigil, my agents, and then Firestarter and beyond. So yeah, that, that was it. It was just the, that eight minute short film mm-hmm. was basically worth 10 years of screenwriting that I had done. Amazing. So mm. do you consider the short, the well, any short of this caliber, like Arcane, I mean, it, it looks like a big budget film for seven mm. or eight minutes. Uh, do you consider this to be kind of a business card in terms <laughs> of like, do you just, here's my street cred. Like, look what I can do. Um, yeah. You, you give me yeah, the tools. And you know, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, it's, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows where this becomes a kind of thing. But I've seen short films that are two to three minutes long, like very short that are not in festivals that are made entirely as calling cards and that have been, have been a hundred percent effective for me. I didn't go to film school. So I really, outside of screenwriting, I didn't understand, know how things work. So it was a, you know, there's a lot of on set learning for me in terms of being a producer and writer and director of arcane and, kind of just figuring out the ropes and I just dove into it for six months and uh, you know, for a two day shoot, but, but got that. But, you know, for folks who have gone to film school, who understand production and you know how these things function. Yeah. It's that can be the calling card. It, you know, I've, I've taught at film school um, and you know, if your thesis or whatever you make coming up, that, that should be it. Like you've got the opportunity right there. You know, the school's paying for it. You've got the, the equipment that should be your calling card and you can use that. So when you were screenwriting, um, we have just a couple more minutes. So I'll ask one more question. When you were, when you were screenwriting, how did you find your community of people that you would um, use as mentors and just for ideas and bouncing ideas off of, and basically your tribe, where did you find those folks being from Colorado? You know what? It really came down to just one person, uh, just a, a good friend of mine that I've known for, for a while who we had the same tastes, who had gone to film school, incidentally. And so I would uh, I'd bring him kind of some of my stuff and say, hey, what do you know? What do you think? You're the film school guy. You understand more of the structure stuff. And so it was both him educating me and then me kind of learning to uh, take creatively what I had in mind and, and put it through that thing. So no, I mean, he's still kind of my right hand man today and I bounce everything off of him. Um, and that was it. It was just that, just the one person. Um, if I had been in LA, you know, most likely I would have gone to meetings and uh, found folks at cafes, you know, you go to, you throw a rock in a cafe in LA, you're going to hit a screenwriter. <laughs> um, so they're, they're there. And a podcaster um, too. <laughs> and a podcaster, probably both. Yeah. They're, they're the same person. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it, it, very invaluable. Shout outs to Jonah. He knows who he is. Okay. Right on. So I have to ask this, um, when you have Firestarter in the can 
mm. and you're ready to premiere, I would love to talk to you again and reconnect yeah, and for just sure. see how that project went. And I wish you all the best as you shoot that film, hopefully in 2021. Yeah, thanks so much. No, that'll be fun. Keith Thomas, thanks for being on the podcast. Mm, thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. <laughs>